Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And uh, Alex, uh, I wanted to tell you something that uh, happened on Friday, something that I'm very excited about. Do you know what happened Friday? Uh, there was a full moon, it was Friday the 13th. I assume Jason Voorhees killed a lot of late goers. Those are all probably true. Uh, cannot confirm, cannot deny. I mean, you can confirm it was the 13th and a full moon. I can confirm that those things were real. But actually, the thing I was talking about is something that I'm probably more excited about than, than you. But uh, Borderlands 3 came out. Oh boy. But something interesting happened when that game released. Uh, the early reviews were talking about uh, how the big problem that they seemed to have was with Borderlands 3 feeling just like more Borderlands. And that that feels a little bit uh, stale. But I thought that the commentary of a game having the problem of being too much like other games in its series was interesting enough that I wanted to discuss it with other games, both digital and analog, so both tabletop and video. Like, I guess the best way I can put it is, you want to innovate, but you don't want to alienate. So you want to keep building something that's new and fresh, but you also don't want to end up alienating the audience that uh, already likes the thing that you have created. Right, you don't want to walk so far away from what you got people into the series that they're no longer interested. Like, you don't want to be like, cool, so it started out as playing Portal, and now you're actually just doing, like, actual puzzles with puzzle pieces. Yeah, now we've... With a gravity gun. We've gone from the physics-based puzzle to literally Shell sits down at a table and starts doing a Sudoku. Congratulations! <laughs> we've, we've messed up the game. <laughs> No, there are no portals in the Sudoku. I thought about that, and I thought about how, you know, traditional board games, uh, like, a, like a Monopoly or a Pandemic or anything that we're used to, Carcassonne is another good example, have a lot of different variations, but their basic mechanics are pretty much always the same. They just kind of twist it or change it a little bit. Mostly it's the board and the map that, that changes a little bit, or how it's themed. Uh, but those aren't necessarily direct sequels to anything. They're not like another step. They're just like a, a kind of like a sidestep <laughs> more than anything. But in terms of uh, at least uh, tabletop games, uh, the thing that I kept thinking about was if you look at role-playing games specifically, this is really where that whole tension between being able to create something new but not lose your audience seems to be the most prevalent. Because you sometimes have to change the entire system around. <laughs> sometimes. At least, you at least tweak it and streamline it and make it work right. You refine it. You don't necessarily change it entirely. Because if you're going to change the entire system around, you might as well just make a new game. Well, then you also have brand recognition, though. Sometimes that's also a, a big factor. But if you were looking at a, a system like when we were talking about Savage Worlds, that's actually one that literally just is the same system and they just keep um, innovating on top of it. But the same basic system just keeps getting more and more mechanics laid on. But if you are a, let's say, a Pathfinder or a Dungeons & Dragons, then the system can completely change between and one version and another. It doesn't change enough to be a different system. Okay, well, that's interesting. So what, what really is the core of saying that it's the system? Because there's a, a wide difference between, like, Thaco and AC. <laughs> They're both technically Dungeons & Dragons from two different versions. But what is the real core of what you would say is, is D&D? D&D is the D20 system. Okay, so as long as you have the dice... But, but there are other systems that use D20s, too. Yes, but okay. the core of D&D &D is the D20 system. Your, your attributes, uh, uh, adding to the skills they add to, and your characters, classes, and abilities. So those mechanics really make up your core system. But okay. say, armor class versus you know Thaco, that's mm. a subsystem they changed within it, but it didn't change any of the core mechanics. It just changed how those core mechanics actually balance out and work. Uh, because the, throughout this entire time, they have changed things like 
what classes you can be, um, what races you can be, et cetera, et cetera. Well, yeah, but that's not the core system, not the core mechanics. That's, you know, in the player's handbook, there's only so many races, so many classes. And yeah. then they go ahead and they go, here's some extra stuff. Here are some more classes. Here's mm-hmm. some more variants on the classes. Here are some more races and more variants of races. Right. So they don't right. change how the game is played. They change your options for playing the game, though. I see. Okay. So if I were looking at, like, my D20, I got my D20 in front of me right now. Oh, good. Like, this and all the support mechanics that are around that, like, skill check, stuff like that, that's all still indicative of D&D, regardless of what version I was looking at. Yeah, essentially. I mean, if the an earlier version didn't have it specifically, like, say, advantage and disadvantage were not around in 3.5. Right. Those are newer mechanics that they added for balance, I believe. Right. And they add they add variety, but they also help balance things out so that instead of saying, Oh, you can't do it or you you take this they overhauled the entire skill system so now you can get advantage on a skill check instead right. of being like, Yeah, I got fifteen points in the sneak. Yeah, the, the skill system was also something that uh I know has gotten changed and modified over the course of time. But the idea that you have skills, since that's kind of like the basic concept that your skills derive from your basic stats, and that's all still pretty much standard, because I don't remember much from... Pretty much. I mean, at the core, most RPGs are, like, if they've got sequels, the core systems are going to be similar, but with tweaks. I know for, like, L5R, Mm. from 1st edition to 2nd edition, they tweaked things. They kept the same system pretty much but they tweak things same thing with like world of darkness mm-hmm. or with um the warhammer 40k rpgs they tweak yeah. it from like dark air seed first and set to second edition yeah. they t- take it and they go all right where are things not working well where do we need to balance it and they they'll tweak those things w- what ends up happening with tabletop games rpgs specifically uh in their sequels and the games from the first iteration to uh, later iterations is they tend to streamline things out. I'm not going to say ever, but they don't, I think, typically get crunchier as they sequel out. It doesn't seem to be that. It feels like they try to streamline things so that the mechanics are out of the way more than anything else. Right, and I think that's the thing. First editions to games, you'll find, are often very clunky and crunchy because it's you're getting all these ideas out into a game, you get the game, and it's playable, in the, and you see it, and you are like, all right, cool, so this is playable, and it's the way we want it to be. And you get people playing it, and you find out what works, and what's kind of annoying to do, and what's <laughs> not useful, and then you kind of go, all right, so this isn't really necessary, this is overbearing, et cetera, et cetera, this takes too much time. Yeah, That's one of those things with like an opposed role system, in theory, sounds great. Because you can roll against your opponent. Uh-huh. But in practice, it ends yeah. up bogging down everything with extra dice rolls. Sort of like a um, a location-based hit system. Again, in yeah. theory, sounds awesome. But in practice, it bogs down time. It takes a lot more to do everything. There have been some uh, games that their downfall was that they made things way too complicated. <laughs> right. And um and usually in like war games more than RPGs, but uh yeah, where you're trying to determine the trajectory of bullets and stuff like that. Where it's like, okay, we're getting a little too deep in the weeds. It's not fun, it's not streamlined. Yeah. Uh I think a lot of people would say that compared to earlier versions of D and D, five E is definitely more of a streamlined system, especially five, for new players. Five E is a really um, nice in that regards because it is really friendly to new players. But now, on the other hand, though, I had like I was playing with someone who's used to uh, older versions of of the game too. One thing that she wasn't real fond of in Five E was that you don't really get to like your skills are all ba- basically based on like your class and everything like that. You don't really get a lot of options to customize your skill levels like you did in previous games, like being able to add specifically to those. And I get that. Yeah, I can see where somebody might say that that feels a little bit alienating if you're used to stuff like that in earlier versions. Which which also kind of leads me back to that idea of how you maintain 
uh, a certain identity without risking it down the road, but but still trying to create something new. I would say too, with like D and D, and even with with some of the other ones like Pathfinder, Warhammer, uh, and all those, is your setting. Uh, even though they've they've changed and they've modified settings over the years and they've created new ones, is that it does kind of have a thematic quality to it that has helped create an identity. Like Faerun is sort of indicative of that. Forgotten Realms is indicative of D and D. Well, on the flip side, you also have a game like Magic: The Gathering, mm-hmm. which at its core has always been essentially the exact same game. They have different formats for playing the game, so you have different rule sets to abide by for your decks and what's legal. Yes, but at the core, the game is played the same way. The difference is with them; they don't have they don't have sequel games. They have expansions essentially every yes. new set yep and yep. the thing there is they don't really streamline and cut back old mechanics or whatever phase them out they still are legal if you're playing a game uh, type format that you can use those cards and they have that ability mm. that's it's never gone away that right. like flanking you yeah. know phasing for instance it uh-huh. it's never gone away you can still play the phasing cards they're mm-hmm. not suddenly no longer viable at all ever right. i mean if they were ever viable but <laughs> yeah whether they were useful in the first place isn't it? the difference is with like uh from D where they go all right new edition new rules all the old rules are now superseded this is a completely right different version of the game magic on the other hand goes yeah no everything that happened before is still canon right yeah, that's all fine. Yeah. But here are new mechanics, new abilities, new things we're adding to it to spice it up and make it different. Right. And that's where you get into the point of there are so many mechanics that it can be overbearing for some people. But yes. you can also go into the uh, part where it becomes alienating. That's why I stopped playing Magic, because the new abilities that were coming in to the game at the time when I was getting out of it were like indestructible. Okay, yeah. And I was like, yeah. this is just, it just, some of the new stuff they added just alienated me. I'm like, I don't like that. I will say, though, that if, if you think about it, um, Magic, at least when it was created, did something really smart. A lot of the game and how the game plays is done on the individual cards. The actual rule set itself is so very light. So if you want to create, totally change the game you don't have to undercut the basic ideas that are out there like i i put down a land so now i can use it to tap and then i can put out cards based on what kind of mana that i have available those are the core rules that that's basically the core of magic that's basically everything everything else everything else that's rules in that game revolves around what happens to be on the cards so if you want to change a lot of mechanics or you want to implement stuff you don't have to throw out what you had before. You don't have to undercut what the game was. It basically said that at the front. All the cards themselves basically change that, depending on what comes out into play. And you know, that's actually a good analogy for how different classes, and like, we're going to mm. switch gears now, mm. in a game like World of Warcraft, see, the core game is the same core game for everybody. But right. your different classes augment how you interact with the game. Your right. different abilities and spells and what you can use for weapons and armor, they are what augment your rule set. Mm-hmm. So you're all playing by the same core rules, but suddenly you being an elf warrior versus a orc rogue, you're playing with two different rule sets in the same core mechanics. Right, right. Yeah, and that that can be kind of tricky, too, considering that that game's been around for so long. We're at, like, 15 years now uh-huh. uh, to try and keep it uh, so that it, it feels fresh, but it doesn't feel like it's alienating to players. And, you know, that's something they've had to deal with as well. And this is why this topic is really good for tabletop and video games. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, we, we talked about a little bit before Dead Space, for instance, they just kind of... They went yeah. so far away from what the original concept of the game was that it yeah. stopped being what the game was. Yeah, and I mean, we could talk a little bit, too, about some bad examples of, of of this, because 
Yeah, what Visceral did with the original Dead Space was they created sort of like a, a space horror game. And people really liked that. And whether it was due to like studio pressure or whatever, the later titles went further and further into really an action adventure shooter. It's kind of a gritty action game. It yeah, it, it was much more focused on the action part and far less on the horror part. So if you were really interested in the atmosphere and what it was building in that first game, you would feel kind of disappointed. I can say that I've played them all. <laughs> uh so I, I'm familiar with this system. Not a ton of Dead Space Two, I have to say, but I played a fair amount of one and I finished three. Um, I actually, for me, a, a reduction of the horror and more onto the action elements was nice for me. <laughs> I liked that myself. Oh, well, so, that's good then. So 3 actually ends up lending itself a little bit more to my play style. But I understand why, if you liked that tight, those tight corridors and that, you know, limited ammunition and everything that you had in the first game, and how that really made you think about the world and, and you know, that there's, there's stuff coming for you around every corner with the necromorphs, you'd be a very disappointed in 3 when there's ammo everywhere and you're flying around shooting things like it's going out of style. Right. It's the difference between what makes an action shooter in a game like Resident Evil, mm -hmm. where in late yes. RE4 you couldn't walk and use your gun at the same time. No. And there was very, you had to, you know, budget your ammunition because you mm -hmm. couldn't just pick it up everywhere. Yeah. And that's, that's the difference between an action game and a horror game right there too. Right. Because right. if you go from this to that, then it's like, all right, well, you just lost everything that made this game so much more thought provoking for you. Right. And Resident Evil is a good example of that too, because you'll remember the early games, they had kind of the limitation of having those singular static can camera angles, you know, right. were, were going around. The 4 was the first time where you actually had the behind-the-back camera on Leon. But then they took that 4, and then they made Resident Evil 5. And then that became much more of an action game. And again, that's where a lot of the fan base goes for is, like, the best. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they do. They're like four is the best uh, Resident Evil game, and they—I mm -hmm. think they just did the HD remake for it. Yeah. Oh, probably. I think they've remade that several times now. Like they—they they had five, then they had six, which was like they basically just threw all of the different characters into different vignettes and stuff. That was—that seemed like too much of a hodgepodge for me to get into. Um, but then the one that they came back with recently was Resident Evil Seven, and that's a, another one where it feels like they were going returning to form and they made like a claustrophobic environment with this house where there are enemies that you don't think you can kill at all <laughs> and and that became something that people really loved people really liked that because it went back to the emphasis kind of like the feeling of the earlier games right and actually when they just went back and did like uh the big thing everyone was on was resident 2 remake they did a resident evil 2 remake so that it's no longer the static camera angles it's it's more like resident evil 4 and people really loved that they didn't think that it would necessarily work because they've changed the whole game completely from perspective from how it interacts but it feels more like resident evil 4 in yeah. how it interacts and people actually really really liked that return which is probably the reason why they're going back and doing it but like, like, hey, let's take one of our best games and let's see if we can take the old games and make them like that. <laughs> let's do that. That makes me wonder what's going to happen with the uh, Final Fantasy VII remake. Yeah, because that looks like it's functioning a lot more like 15. How it that looks was more, more like action. an action game, whereas... 15 was an action, was more action. I believe game. 7 was just a turn-based game. Yep. Yeah, 7 was a turn-based game. Even, even Final Fantasy X... Yeah, you know, the camera would follow you, but there are certain points in it where you had a fixed angle camera, and you could move yeah. around the map area, but it was just a fixed angled camera. Yeah, and then they, they did change that up in several different iterations. That's actually an interesting series in itself because if you think about it, Final Fantasy takes place in such disparate places with such disparate stories, yet they can keep an identity that that makes it uniquely Final Fantasy. I think the identity is that none of the games are are sequential. <laughs> yeah, but you say that, but then there was like there was X two, and then there were actually three games for Final Fantasy thirteen. 
Yeah, and then Seven had a couple sub games after it, like that yeah. weren't true to form. And right, we don't talk about Ten Two. <laughs> you don't. People like I mean, Ten Two. I thought people They're... hated Ten Two. No, I think a lot of people actually liked Ten Two. Uh, but and as ironically, I liked Thirteen Two more than Thirteen, but not Lightning Returns. But Thirteen Two was interesting. For some reason that's that's time flippy stuff that they were doing in that one. That was a uh, that was interesting. It was innovative. But it but you do assume like we've talked about that on the show is that like there's going to be a character named Sid. There are going to be Chocobos. There are going to be Cactuars. That that They're run in the, and screw your, your day. bestiaries are going to be more or less the same. They're completely different stories that don't seem to be correlated at all. But your your characters like your characters are always going to be spiky haired heroes that that have to save the world from a god. They're going to be teenagers. Yeah, they're going to be spiky-haired teenagers that have destiny to save the world from a god. So we kind of have that <laughs> that down. Uh, and that there's going to be some uh, monsters that are going to look very similar from game to game. Um, I feel like and, we need to do a trope now. We're on a, D- a D&D game or RPG where you're spiky-haired teenagers. With oh, the, yeah. Where you're just... Start, no, not, not Rift Hunters. Um, no, not Rift Hunters. <laughs> something completely where you're, different. Where you're spiky-haired teenagers and you mm-hmm. need to kill God. Yeah. A god. Yeah. Maybe a couple gods. Me, I'm just Ash Ketchum. I'm just Ash Ketchum. Yeah, you finally w- became a Pokemon League master. Yeah, I know. Th- congratulations, Ash Ketchum. And you know, actually, that does get me thinking about Pokemon. Because if you're thinking about uh, games that have been able to hold on to an identity while con- continually changing the way the game kind of plays. Huh. and Sometimes different mechanics, drastically. Sometimes drastically. It's Pokemon. And it's not always for the best. No, but it's not. No. Um, but they do. You're right. It's it's canonically the game is very much the game. You can tell it's the same game. You can tell they're different because each one is a different story being told. You're right. They do change certain mechanics. Are added each game. They add new things, or at least they tr- they try new things. Uh, and I love that one thing about Nintendo is they aren't afraid to innovate. But but they do. They stay from first. Gen, the second gen, I think they added um, hell items. And third, they added the berries, and then they added even more stuff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then shinies and whatnot. They've added things every single time, and they don't generally take away a lot. Those additions are usually fairly light. Like they don't get super into changing up the overall mechanics. Like you still battle Pokemon. Well, still... until recently, anyways. Right. Until Pokemon Go came out, and then Sword and Shield. Yeah. Not Sword and Shield. Uh, Not Sword and Shield. Let's go Pikachu and let's go Eevee. Where right. it's like you don't battle the Pokemon, you just throw Pokeballs at it. You throw the Pokemon. Well, you still it, you still battle other trainers with the Pokemon you've caught. You don't have the wild Pokemon battles. You don't have the wild Pokemon battles. I don't... And I see, think it's Sword and Shield that's coming back, but I'm not sure. I, you know, I don't like that though i don't like that they took that away because yeah that was a big component of like why you play like why you play the slots right it's that random chance it's when you can see the pokemon on the field yeah it's still random chance but you know your odds you know you're getting into beforehand you can go in there and then if you just throw pokeballs at it yeah i guess they can run but you don't have that chance of knocking them out right you know you don't get a chance to fight them and gain xp you just capture them and gain xp it's it's yeah that is boring to me that's a boring experience i like the rng i like the random numbers generations yeah. i like the random battles yeah that's a little too streamlined it doesn't it's, have enough it's too simple bones. yeah of course that that could be said about almost any mobile game that's a whole subject in itself well i mean mobile. the switch ones aren't technically a mobile game even though it is a mobile platform yeah but that it's that's like no bit, i would yeah. like mm-hmm. I, I want them to stick to that formula they've had for the last eight generations right even though they switch it up it's like yeah keep that that's your core and you've just taken a big chunk of your core gameplay away and yes right. some people like it but then there's other people like me that don't because yeah. of that exact reason it's just you're stripping away part of that experience. And that's tough because you're always trying to figure out ways that you could expand your audience but without losing the audience that you already had. And I mean, Pokemon Go and, and, and Let's Go Eevee, Let's Go Pikachu are definitely great ways to expand your audience, but... Right. 
they're not necessarily for your core audience. That's, right, that's and your core important. audience yeah. will probably still get them because mm-hmm. your core audience are are Pokemon freaks. Oh, they're of gonna course. Get every game you make. Oh yeah, I mean, let's face it, most of the people I know who are playing Pokemon Go are in their thirties, <laughs> and they are used to playing the Pokemon Go for the the Pokemon from like the original Game Boy. Half of the yeah. players are in their thirties, and half of the players are ten. <laughs> that's very much the demographic You're for Pokemon much. Go. But now Sword and Shield, if they find a marrying quality between being able to to do the kind of the crunchier, the RNG kind of stuff that you that you were talking about, being able to actually do those Pokemon battles and get a little bit deeper in the weeds while still having it more streamlined could be a good solution to try and make everybody somewhat happy with with an experience. But you never know, you know, you never know, like when you add something in or you take something away what people's reaction is going to be and who's going to like it and what demographics going to enjoy it. The other one that I could say is a bad example <laughs> is one that I've complained about before, which of course is Fallout. Uh, yes. You could say Fallout 76 is, is a Fallout game. I mean, Bethesda definitely did. But the reason I think it alienates a lot of people besides a lot of the technical problems and the ge- general bad ideas that were put into it is that it doesn't feel like a Fallout experience because so much of the core of what you liked about Fallout is not in there. I don't right. shape the world at but all. I think if they things. hadn't called it a Fallout game, mm-hmm. they would have been okay. I think if they had said this takes place in the Fallout universe, yeah, it would have been better. But calling it a Fallout yeah. game is not the same thing as taking place in the Fallout universe. It, they, they could have thrown a different coat of paint on that. And just created a new game series out of it, and people would not have been able to say, hey, this feels like Fallout. If you literally just changed the character models and the storyline and everything, the, the, the literal, you know, storytelling part of that and the layer of the cosmetic part, it would feel like a completely different game because the game doesn't right. function the same way. It, you, you don't have actual influence on the world itself. You're not interacting with other characters. I know they're adding that in, but I I doubt that it's going to be particularly rich because they. I can't. don't know how. Honestly, we've talked about this before, but I don't know how they're going to suddenly add a, hundreds of NPCs to a game. The, the MMO. lore there's hard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's there's yeah. The lore in that is going to be hard. I guess their idea is that people are coming back into the wasteland, and so now you're meeting people that are. But it's like, Again, so where where the hell well, have they see, been? <laughs> see, World of Warcraft could pull this off. Yeah, yeah. They could pull this off. They've done stuff like not adding hundreds of NPCs, but they've over like when a new expansion is coming out, they've had events leading up to it several patches in advance. Like when we had the, the uh, revolution, Dark Spear Revolution. Mm. That was leading up to Warlords of Draenor. That was yeah. leading up to the Siege of Ogrimmar. Right. And so what they did, instead of just, like, adding in, they added in this these quest lines and these things going on, these events happening in real time. Yeah. And they would advance uh, the next patch that would advance, and it would advance until you get to the, the siege. Mm-hmm. And that's what they do, and they stage it like that. And part of the reason they do that is to keep people playing. Right. Um, because if you give everyone all the content at once, they'll just finish it and be done. Right. But if you stagger it like that and make it take a while to come out, mm-hmm. then you've got people playing because, oh, suddenly, cool, I've been doing this and I don't have anything left to do. Oh, now there's new stuff. Cool, I have to go do this now. Yeah. And so, like, with that, it's you You waged a revolution. Right. And you just, it went from the events of Vol'jin, uh, his attempted assassination, mm-hmm. to him coming back. And him going and mm. leading a revolution and you being part of it. And then World Warcraft's team is great at this. Yeah. Yeah. They've, they've had years mm-hmm. of working on this site. They've been doing it since Lich King. The, uh, the one other thing that we didn't really talk about is what happens when you don't innovate enough. Because this was the criticism right. that was really levied against uh, Borderlands. Is that like maybe they didn't innovate enough over previous versions of the game. And it feels too similar. So why would I go out and buy another one? Now, that has not affected their sales, for the record. (laughs) Their sales have been ridiculous. But I don't know. Like, when I see the different mechanics that they've added in, especially with, like, the different 
more defined personalities between different gun companies in that game and how they interact. Um, having multiple special action skills for the different character classes. I'm like, I, I, I don't know really what kind of other innovation you could put into it, but is that a limitation of, of a game sometimes that you just can't innovate? I mean, it really depends on the game. I can't think of a specific example of a game, though. Actually, yes, I can. Monopoly. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Monopoly. There you go. Yeah, see, the problem with a Monopoly is, yeah, literally, the only thing you can do to change that game is theme. You can no, only re We're going to take it. out Go. We're, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're going to take out Go, and now it's a completely different game. Yeah, when you have a game that's so specific like that, where it, it plays a certain way and the rules are very concrete, there's not a lot of wiggle room for how you change. Like, are you going to make a Monopoly board that has like six different sides instead of four? And that's like you... 3D chess. No, no, like... no. <laughs> so what happens is you take out Go. And then what it becomes is you have a finite resource of money. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That would be interesting, but I feel like yeah. that's just an alternate rule. Well, probably, but it would take... You could build it would it be alternating way. the game... That's true. ...to a way that would... It's so limited with what you can do with that rule set. Right. That all, all you can really do is change the theme. Right. Or change your luck and chance cards for that. Yeah, you, you can change so, the overall theme of it. If we were to say take out Go, so you don't receive $200 when you pass Go, there is no way to gain additional money aside <laughs> from properties. Yeah. And that's not even then. You still have a finite resource then, because oh, yeah. you're not gaining any extra money that isn't already in play. Mm -hmm. So then it's just changing bills around, but there's no. It's you're playing with the finite hand. Yeah. And you're just exchanging until someone loses all theirs and someone gets all the rest. There's no right. external source of money there, right. except for the cards that you can draw mm -hmm. when you land on the spaces. Those have a chance of giving you money. Like, my takeaway is, if you have a game and you realize I have to get to version 2 or I have to get to version 3, big thing is to understand what the core of your game is. Whatever the core personality of your game is. What the, it represents. what your core experience is based on. Right, exactly. Understand what your core experience is. Um, if you have a theme or a world, what is really the core of that? What is the core of that experience that people are looking at? Sometimes feedback from people who play is useful, but, you know, just at, at least just in your idea, your innovation, what do you really consider the core of this game, the core identity of it? Make sure that that's in place, because sometimes you can take that formula pretty far and wide as long as you maintain that core, but you gotta know what that core is. Right. Um, you can put a Fallout coat of paint on Rust, but it doesn't make it Fallout. <laughs> no, it makes it Rust, but with a vault suit. Yeah, you ha it's Rust with a vault suit, and that's that not- should be a mod for the game Rust. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, hey, it would it would cost less money too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, just make it that way, man. See, they could have saved themselves so much money if they just licensed a Fallout brand on top of Rust. They wouldn't have had to make the whole game and <laughs> the whole thing. Yeah, understanding your core mechanics, understanding uh, what people play the game for, uh, and then going forward. In that regard, my own personal takeaway: uh, I have not gotten a chance to play it yet, but it should be coming very soon. Uh, for Borderlands 3, everything I saw leading up to it was like, oh yeah, this is the core experience I expect, but it's just more of that, and I don't mind that, because it's what I expected to play, but it does feel new enough that I feel like there's, there's new meat on the bone for me to enjoy. But the core look and the feel and the characters and the world and the, the looter shooter, the feedback loops that they put in, they didn't lose any of that. They were just like, okay, we're going to go full bore on that. And so for me, that's not a problem. I think it's one of those weird things where it's like, you're probably going to like the game if you liked previous games in the series. <laughs> if you didn't like previous games in the series, you're probably not going to like this. And for some people, I understand that that's going to be a problem because how does it introduce new people in? How does it give new people an experience? But you also don't want to make people that have played the previous games feel like it's not that game anymore. 
And that's a really weird balancing act to pull off. All right, Alex. Um, so what version are we on right now of Delve? Uh, what episode is this? This is episode two, uh, 30 something. I don't know. It's we're on, a, we're on version like 20. We're on version 20 now. That's I pretty great. I don't know. We're on, we're on version 230. We're on 2.36. We're on Fortnite. Se- season 10 oh gosh. Yeah, quit. <laughs> hey there's a game that doesn't have to worry about reiterating <laughs> throw no, throw in a bouncy no. house at a pinata you're good you're, you're in good shape man i'm not gonna bash right. fortnite that's just uh no i played enough of it i'm like yeah this isn't bad but it ain't my it ain't my steez my biggest complaint with fortnite if i may divulge for one second is it made every other game think it needs a battle royale mode oh god and it doesn't you know that's the entire premise of fallout 76 right there no the entire premise of fallout 76 legitimately is hey look at what all these other people are doing that made money let's try doing that it's a battle royale yeah well there is a battle royale mode now so oh boy yeah Yeah. now if uh, folks wanted to find out what those previous 20 versions of the show were like where could they go (laughs) You can find previous versions of the show over at delvecast.com. Yes, uh, everything that we do is over there. I actually, last year, sometime, I did a whole video about Fallout where I actually did talk about theme and, uh, and, and touched on some of the stuff that we're talking about here. Uh, but that's on there as well. And uh, while you are there, you can also uh, check out our Patreon uh, please become a patron. We would really appreciate that. For just a dollar a month, you can get the extended episodes uh, and some bonus content that we put out. Uh, sometimes they're little standalone pieces that we were recording, and it just kind of came up. And uh, I think we're going to have one for this, uh, which is which is a, a good little conversation in itself. Uh, so please, it's something. It's something. We don't know what. Uh, but please go out and check that. Uh, thank you to our shiny level patrons, Bonnie Ainsworth and Dominic Perry. You can also find us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, basically everywhere that you find podcasts. So please rate, review, and subscribe at any place that you get your lovely handcrafted podcasts. We would really appreciate that. And uh, do not forget to check us out on Twitter. I am at Citanium. I am at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. And uh, with that being said, I guess we are uh, working on creating version 21 of Delve. Um, Something like that. This one, we, uh, we add new hats and new skins. Yes, uh, Nathan likes to shed his from one time to time. Yes, I'm like a snake. I shed the old skin and the new skin is a, is a new hue. It's a new color. It's branded for the season. It's a spring outfit. <laughs> Even though it's going to be fall. Uh, but anyway, uh, thank you for joining us, everyone. We will see you on the next episode. Goodbye. Bye. Maybe in, like, the Forgotten Realms it's spring right now. I guess it could be any I think it's eternally spring. I've never played a game where it was winter. That's what we need to do. We need to create a version of uh, Dungeons & Dragons which is set in, like, the Game of Thrones world, and winter is always coming. <laughs> I mean, there is, in the Forgotten Realms, in Albiar Toril, there is parts that are covered in snow. Well, like, Spine of the World is pretty much in mountains yeah. and stuff, right? It's, yeah, it's, it's all snowy up there. You know what's actually funny is that when I was playing with Dom, he did make a point of talking about, like, that we were in Elliant at the time, and the, the month was, was Elliant, and so it was going to be getting colder, so he was, like, trying to make it very, very relevant that, indeed, the seasons are changing. See, uh, I've never played a game where that was really relevant yeah, and important, I yeah, guess, but yeah. it all depends. I can't say that it really affected the game all that much, but it was very interesting to think that, indeed, we're getting to a very cool... It's, it, it really depends on the time scale that you take in your adventures, too, so... Right. There was a lot of walking for us. Uh, so that we were on the road for weeks sometimes. Like, our village was supposed to be up not quite at where the spine of the world was, but it was, like, below where that the, those mountain ranges were. But It was far away. It was it was pretty far up there, and where we were, we were coming from, we were over near, like, the, the Sword Coast. 
we were down in that area. Gotcha. Uh, so that's a trek on foot uh, to get bit. to get from one place to the next. So that's one of the reasons why we were just keeping track of time and that you know make sure you have a campfire. <laughs> I think that was the big thing because it's cold. It's yes. getting cool. <laughs> 